So let me introduce our first speaker, Dr. Raj Gandhi. He is a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and the director of HIV clinical services and education at MGH. He's also a site leader of the MGH AIDS clinical research site in the Harvard Miriam AIDS Clinical Trials Unit and chair of the ACTG Reservoirs and Eradication Transformative Science Group. He is also the director of the Harvard CIFAR Clinical Corps, and he's an expert in this area, so we look forward to his presentation. Thanks, Raj. Thanks, Priscilla, and uh, thank all of you for coming. I want to um, reiterate what you just heard, which is the purpose of this is to um, talk about things going on uh, in the HIV cure field, but really to see what is on your mind, to see what you're interested in hearing about. What I'll do is I'll start with an overview, but I've deliberately left it relatively um, brief so that there is time for questions, and so I'm going to um, look to all of you to, to tell me what you're most interested in hearing about. But my purpose in the next few minutes is to talk a little bit about where we are with HIV cure. I'll highlight mostly uh, things we're doing here in Boston, but touch on things that are going on around the country and around the world. So um, let me start with a couple of definitions. So when people talk about cure, they sometimes talk about what's called st sterilizing cure. What that means is that someone has HIV, but there's been a treatment or there's been something done such that there's no more virus left. Essentially, the virus is completely gone and the infection is, is no longer there. Uh, as I'll show you in a minute, there's really only been one case of someone who what, it, what is what we think has had a sterilizing cure. There's also a concept of functional cure, and what that means is, uh, what I like to think of it is remission without antiretroviral therapy. So people with HIV right now are, are on antiretroviral therapy, but if they stop their antiretroviral therapy, the virus comes back. So functional cure is trying to get someone to antiretroviral free remission. And the word remission is used because it's something that you have to keep checking to make sure people are still in remission. And functional cures, we think, are going to rely on strengthening the immune system to control HIV. Because if there's still some HIV present in the body, you need some kind of immune control to, to keep it under wraps, to keep, uh, to keep it from coming back. So let me start out with a basic question, which is why does current antiretroviral therapy, the combinations, the cocktails that work against HIV, why does, not, why does that not cure HIV? Because if you understand why it doesn't cure HIV, then you have some ideas of the strategies that people are taking to try to, to, try to cure it. So I want to take you back um, to 1995. So this was a little over 20 years ago. And 20 years ago, the cocktails came out. Okay, it was December-ish, uh, 1995. And the three drug therapies that, that we now use to this day came out. And what they showed is that if you give three drug therapy, the viral load goes down 10,000-fold. Uh, it goes down from, say, 100,000 copies to less than 100 copies and then less than 50 copies in just a few weeks. So back then, people who were studying HIV and looking at the viral load go down said that they thought that two to three years of antiretroviral therapy, you know, getting the viral load to undetectable might um, eliminate HIV from the body, but they put in an important caveat. They put in kind of a qualification. They said if um, there were sanctuaries or if there were, un if there were compartments, if there was places that the virus could hang out, even on antiretroviral therapy, even if the viral load was undetectable, then it was going to take longer. Okay, so that's what we knew in 1995. So two years later, 1997 to 1999, Three groups found out there was just such a reservoir. There was a, a, a group of cells that I'm going to show you that despite antiretroviral therapy still stay infected. Okay, so the viral load, the, the blood test that people with HIV get on a routine basis is undetectable, but this reservoir was detected in 1997, 1998. Now I want to, I'm going to take you through one kind of science slide because I think this really gets to how this um, cure field is really thinking about this. And so this is the science slide, and I'm, I'm going to walk through this um, so, we, so we're all on the same page. So what HIV does is it infects CD4 cells. So many of you know the CD4 cells are the way we measure, you know, you know how strong the immune system is. HIV infects CD4 cells, but it doesn't infect any CD4 cell. It infects the type of CD4 cell that is trying to fight off infections. It's called an activated CD4 cell. The trouble is, once it infects that CD4 cell, it can get itself into the DNA of the CD4 cell. Okay, so it's no longer just in the blood. It's inside the DNA of the CD4 cell. And why that's important is if it's inside the DNA, it can live there for a lifetime because it's now part of the genetic material, what the part of the cell that kind of reproduces itself year after year. 
The reason why that's important is CD4 cells are designed to live for decades. That's why if you get measles as a teenager or as a 10-year-old, uh, you don't get measles as a 60-year-old because you still have CD4 cells against measles. So those CD4 cells live for a lifetime. So once HIV gets into those long-lived CD4 cells, it's very hard for the immune system to see it. Essentially, it becomes latent. It's kind of hidden from the immune system. And the other very important part about this is those CD4 cells get infected within a few weeks of, an, of someone getting HIV. So it doesn't take long for this reservoir to build up. So even if you get antiretroviral therapy a few weeks after getting HIV, you still have this reservoir. A very important study was done where they took people living with HIV, put them on antiretroviral therapy, and found and measured how many of these latently infected cells there were, how big was this reservoir. And this slide shows you that over um, time, the number of those CD4 cells that have latent HIV, sleeping HIV, or hidden HIV, it's essentially flat. They don't really go down. And it takes, we think, 70 years of antiretroviral therapy to get rid of all those latently infected cells. So that's why current HIV medicines, the triple cocktails that many people are on, don't cure HIV. It's because of this reservoir of, of, of latently infected cells. I go through this in part because I want to set the stage for um, a couple of uh, very really important cases that have shown us that at least it's theoretically possible to cure HIV. But I want you to think about these reservoir of cells when we talk about the strategies, the clinical trials that are going on uh, to try to get at this latent reservoir. Okay, so the conclusion from this part of this is the reservoir of infected cells persists despite antiretroviral therapy. Despite the viral load being less than 50, being undetectable, there's still a reservoir of cells that you, you don't measure when you go to the doctor, but if you do a research study, they can find those cells. And it's that reservoir that prevents HIV from being cured. Okay. So as many of you know, there have been some recent cases that have really inspired uh, these efforts to try to cure HIV. I'm going to go through a couple of them. I'll go through one notable case that many people have heard of, but then I'll go through a couple of cautionary tales, things that really uh, tell us uh, that this is, you know, this is going to be a challenge. So the case that most of you have heard of, the first and to this date only sterilizing HIV cure is, is shown on this slide. This is a 40-year-old man. At the time, he was 40. He had leukemia. To treat his leukemia, he had a bone marrow transplant, and the doctors who, who treated his leukemia chose a donor uh, that, had, that lacked the protein that HIV ne needs to get into the cell. So the donor for the bone marrow transplant was essentially immune to HIV, okay? And they did that on purpose. So following the transplant, what happens when you get a bone marrow transplant is you dest destroy the leukemia. That's how a bone marrow transplant works. And then it gets replaced. The, the body cells, the white blood cells, get replaced by the donor cells. And I'll take your question in just one second. Thank you for asking. So they, these cells were now impervious or immune um, to to HIV. And after the transplant, this man stopped antiretroviral therapy and he's been freed for HIV probably now closer to 10 years. So this is an example of a sterilizing cure. You can't find HIV in, in this man's body. So please, take your, let me take your question. Yeah, my question was, so the donor, yeah. did he not have the full receptors? Exactly, okay. exactly. So um, there, to get into a cell, HIV has to bind CD4, and it gets into CD4 cells, but it has to bind a co-receptor. That co-receptor, um, if it's missing, and about 1% of the population is missing that co-receptor, then HIV can't get into the cell, and, and therefore HIV can't infect that CD4 cell. So did that? Yeah. You, you, you're exactly right. It was missing the co-receptor. I'm going to pause, though, and see if there's any questions, because this, is, this has inspired a lot of the efforts, but um, I want to make sure that this is clear before we go on to a couple of other examples, and then I'll go through. So please. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So the protein that was lacking in, in this donor, 1% of people lack this protein, is a, is a co-receptor. It's known as CCR5. That's the co-receptor for HIV. And if, it's interesting. We don't know why. Uh, some people lack it, but those people seem to be healthy. So the doctors that did this transplant chose a donor that was lacking the protein, was lacking the co-receptor. They did it on purpose because they were hoping to make this man immune to HIV, and, and they were you successful. Yeah, so you, part of the problem is the only way to um, replace someone's immune system is to go through the rigors, you know, the, 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 um, the risks of a bone marrow transplant, and I don't have this on the slide, but the reason why this is more of a, um, what we call a proof of concept, it, it proves that you can do it, but it doesn't show us a practical way to do it, 
is because the bone marrow transplant itself is, is very intense. It can kill people. You know, probably about 10% of people who go through a bone marrow transplant will have a serious complication. So this is not a strategy that people are trying to do for anyone other than someone who has leukemia. But it does make you think, are there other ways? And actually, I'm going to, near the end, I'm going to come back to one way. So keep the co-receptor in mind. Keep the protein in mind. They're one and the same. It's called CCR5. Um, um, we'll talk a little bit about the end about kind of Star Wars kind of things called, uh, called gene therapy, and there is a gene therapy approach where they're trying to take out this uh, co-receptor without going through a bone marrow transplant because it is too dangerous to do unless you've got leukemia. So. Okay, so this inspired a lot of uh, hope, but then there was two, th um, case, two scenarios that I want to mention that you, again, might have heard of, but I want to kind of fill in the details that, that are cautionary tales, okay? So the first um, scenario that you might have heard of is called the Mississippi child. This was a, um, an infant who was born to an HIV-infected mother. This uh, infant was starting on, started on antiretroviral therapy really quickly, within a day or so, at 30 hours of birth. Okay? So that's, often, that's much earlier than is usually done. The infant was treated for 18 months with antiretroviral therapy with you know, a cocktail, but then um, stopped coming to the doctor, got lost. Um, no one knew where she was. Or I actually don't know if it's a she, a she or he. Um, when the child got, came back into care, surprisingly, the viral load was undetectable, and the child had not been on antiretroviral therapy at this point. So what happened is this inspired a lot of hope that maybe this extremely early treatment, 30 hours after birth, somehow prevented HIV from getting a foothold in the child. Maybe it, maybe it cured the child. But what happened is the child now was back in care and now was getting viral load testing done routinely, and for almost two years was undetectable, but 27 months, a little over you know, two years and a quarter, the viral load came back. So that meant, and when they looked at the, the type of virus, it was the same type of virus as the child was infected with. So this um, showed us that um, early treatment can tamp down the virus, but it's probably not enough to get rid of the virus. It also showed us something that um, the next two cases showed us, and I'll tell you what that is in a minute. These are the so-called Boston patients. These were people that were treated up the hill from here, just, just a few um, blocks from here. These were two HIV-positive individuals who did have cancer. They also had a bone marrow transplant, but they did not have a bone marrow transplant from someone who was missing the co-receptor, okay? So this was a little different. They just had a kind of, it's not a regular bone marrow transplant, but it wasn't the same as the, the person who was cured. But what was important about these two people, these were two men, is that the HIV was undetectable in the blood and in the tissues. So they went through a careful antiretroviral treatment interruption. They stopped antiretroviral therapy. And both patients had viral rebound. That is, the virus came roaring back. One three months after they stopped antiretroviral therapy, and the other person eight months. That's a bit slower. Um, Dr. Lee is going to talk about what we usually see when you stop therapy. That's quite a bit slower. So the, the treatment had done something, but it hadn't cured it. Okay. So this is going to highlight the challenge I'm going to, um, I'm going to pose to the field. I'm going to pose to all of us is, with our current tests, the viral load is undetectable. Even the research tests that we have don't always detect HIV. That is, you can still have HIV present, like in the Mississippi child and in these Boston patients, but we just can't see it because there's, it's such a low amount. Okay, so one of the big challenges in a lot of the work that's going on in HIV cure is to try to get better tests to detect low levels of HIV below the levels of, of what you know, most of the tests can do. We need better tests. Okay, so these are, I think, what most of our trials are focusing on. These are the two things that the field is trying to sort out. How do we um, accurately measure that reservoir, you know, those last few cells that can cause the virus to come back? And then most, even more importantly, I guess, how do we reduce the reservoir? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, what people are doing. And I see a question there, so let's take that question. Okay. It's a good question. Um, the question for those I think most heard it, most of you heard it is, are we going to have a cure in our lifetime? You know, um, I've done this long enough to know uh, when I first started doing this back in 19, um, well, 86 was when I was a medical student, and so 88 was when I first saw my first person with HIV. I had, there was little, back then we didn't know we would be where we are now with, with treatment, so I am um, cautiously optimistic that if we take the same tack, you know, get people engaged in research, do some of these trials, build upon what we learn, 
I don't think we're going to get there this year, next year, or even the year after that, but I think we could, with slow, steady progress, get there. Um, so um, some of the tools I'm going to show you are better than they used to be. Um, vaccines are getting better than they used to be, so I, I think we might. Uh, I, I'm hopeful that we will get there. As to whether it's in my lifetime or your lifetime or the youngest person in this room's lifetime, I don't know. So, yeah. But I wouldn't be doing it if I didn't think it was possible. I see an, uh, another question. Yeah. Um, would Yeah. So I think the question is, in one, did the child um, in part re relapse? You know, did the virus come back because there was not a strong immune response against the virus? It could be. It could be. Um, you know, uh, we know that children um, have different immune systems, obviously, than adults. And this child probably was exposed to HIV for such a short period of time that he or she didn't have much immunity. So when we get to some of the strategies to reduce the reservoir, it's not just reducing it, it's trying to build up an immune response. And so that is one of the strategies that's being taken. I will take other questions, though, and happy to take them at the end. But is there any other questions before we get into these two big challenges? OK. Um, OK, so Dr. Lee is going to talk about this in much, much more detail. but. I just showed that it's very hard to find HIV in some people who have had, say, a bone marrow transplant, but yet it's still there. So one of the ways people are trying to figure out how much HIV is left in the body, and Dr. Lee will talk about this as, in more detail, is to find a marker. Is there some, something in the blood that can tell you that HIV is still there? And, and if it's still there, does it tell you how long it will be before the rebound will start if you stop antiretroviral therapy? Is there a biomarker? And so what he'll talk about is what's called an antiretroviral pause, where antiretroviral therapy, HIV meds are stopped, usually for a short period of time, just to see how long it takes for the virus to come back and then put people right back on therapy and get them undetectable again. Because we think that if we can find a marker that predicts how long it takes for the virus to rebound, then we might be able to reduce that marker and with a treatment and hopefully prolong that remission, prolong the time off of antiretroviral therapy, and, and he'll, he'll talk about that. So um, one of the reasons why these pauses are, are I think, um, uh, becoming the way of the future is that they're safer than the longer treatment interruptions we did back, say, 10 or 15 years ago. They don't seem to expand the reservoir. They should only be done as part of a clinical trial. That is, this isn't something you should do outside of a trial because you have to be monitored usually at least weekly. And he'll describe studies that are going on to try to um, you know, tease out how big is the reservoir using these, these short pauses. Okay, so how do we reduce the reservoir or how do we get immunity against the reservoir? Those are kind of part and parcel of this, the, the next challenge. Okay, so these are a few of the ways that people are trying to reduce the reservoir. Early antiretroviral therapy started very early. Uh, what we call latency reversing agents, which I'll talk about. Immune therapies boost the immune response and then gene therapies. So these are some of the things that people are doing. So the current strategies, people like to sometimes um, divide them into what's called expose, clear, and protect. Okay, these are the three strategies that a lot of the trials are, are working on. So expose means, remember how I talked about that reservoir, that, that group of cells that the immune system essentially can't see because the HIV is in the DNA. It's kind of inside the cell, hidden away from the immune system. So one strategy is to try to make that cell, that invisible cell, visible to the immune system. Can you make it vulnerable to immune attack? So that's the expose strategy, and I'll, I'll give you an example of expose. Get that HIV to show itself so that the immune system can find it. So expose is one strategy. The other is clear. Try to enhance the immune response against those infected cells. People with HIV do have an immune response against their virus, but it's just not effective enough, okay? Um, it's probably because the virus is damaging their immune system, or at least it did before they got onto antiretroviral therapy. So can you get better clearance? That's the next strategy. And then the last strategy is to try to protect. You know, people were talking about that co-receptor a second ago, the protein. Can you modify the CD4 cells just like that bone marrow transplant patient had, but can you do it in a safer way to make those CD4 cells essentially immune or resistant to HIV without going through a bone marrow transplant. So those are the three categories. And I'll give you a couple examples here in Boston of things people are doing in each of these categories. OK, so expose. Can you get HIV to expose itself so that the immune system can attack it? So I already told you that latent HIV is hidden. It's silenced. It's uh, under, the, under, under wraps. 
So latency reversing agents expose HIV such that we hope they, ca they can be recognized and eliminated by the immune system. So you will hear us talk about what are called latency reversing agents. They're called things like HDAC inhibitors. Um, there's two trials in Boston. One is of a HDAC inhibitor called Varinostat that, that I'm going to describe. And then another one called Panabinostat, a study uh, in the act called Activate. These are latency reversal agents, and people have shown that if you give a single dose of one of these HDAC inhibitors, you can get HIV to expose itself, not enough to get rid of it, otherwise we wouldn't, <laughs> you know, uh, but just enough to just pick itself up so that hopefully the immune system can begin to see it. Okay, so that's strategy number one. I'm just going to look around to see, and I'm going to take questions because I think we built in a good amount of time, but uh, I see another question. Uh, go ahead, please. Okay, I just want to talk for a second. Yeah, please. Yeah. With newly diagnosed patients. Yeah. Well, I'm somebody who's been living with this for 25 years. Right. So where is the hope for us to have been there with the long Yeah. So these strategies I'm now describing are for people who've been infected for, for many, many years because the early ART, starting therapy as soon as possible after you get it, isn't enough to get rid of HIV. So even people who, say, today come in and just got uh, HIV, say, a couple of weeks ago, even if I start antiretroviral therapy in that person today, it won't get rid of the HIV. So these same strategies that I'm talking about, this expose, clear, and protect, that is for people who have had HIV and been on meds for many, many years, you know, even 25 years. They are for people who are on antiretroviral therapy, though. That, that is one thing that, just to be clear, um, you have to be on antiretroviral therapy to get the virus down to the point that we can get, the, we can have a hope of getting rid of the rest of it. But does that answer your question? These things are not for people who are just diagnosed. Okay, I just want to piggyback on something. Yeah, sure. Um, with, I'm just talking about the other individuals. Yeah. You know, I hear you. I mean, as people live longer with HIV and because of the meds, especially the older meds, but even the current meds, they can have effects on the other organs, kidneys, bones, hearts. So I'm not saying that this is the only kind of research going on. I'm just saying that this is important types of research to try to get, to try to cure HIV. But there are other things that I, I'm happy to maybe at the end come back to, to try to help, help protect the heart, help protect the kidneys, help protect the bone uh, from the meds. But I, I hear what you're saying. Okay, let, let's talk about strategy number two, which is the immune strategy, clearing the, the, um, those infected cells. And here, the reason I, you know, someone just, you just asked me a minute ago, is there, this going to happen in our lifetime? One explosion in the HIV cure field are um, what are called broadly neutralizing antibodies. You're going to hear about these from um, kind of the lightning round at the end, because people in town in the Longwood area and others are, are studying these broadly neutralizing antibodies. Antibodies are the body's own way of fighting infection. So when you get, um, you know, again, measles, or if you get an infection, not only do you get those CD4 cells, but you get antibodies. That, that's what makes you immune, say, to hepatitis B. You know, when you get the Hep B vaccine, you get an antibody to hepatitis B, and you're immune to hepatitis B. So these broadly neutralizing antibodies are antibodies against HIV. They target it, they neutralize it, and they're being tested for prevention, treatment, and cure. Okay, and there are multiple studies here in Boston in these, uh, of these broadly neutralizing antibodies that work against a whole array of different types of HIV. They started out with single antibodies, one at a time, but just like with antiretroviral therapy, you probably need a combo because if you just give a single antibody, the virus can uh, you know, evade it or, or mutate or change or evolve to get uh, resistant to it. So now folks in town are doing combination antibody studies and the person sitting in the front row uh, Dr. Sibris is going to do a three-in-one uh, antibody, so three antibodies all in one, um, kind of like three pills, you know, three meds in one um, is what we use to treat HIV. Another immune uh, mechanism to try to clear HIV is interferon. Um, I don't know if any of you have had um, hep C or know people with hep C, but hep interferon used to be used to treat hep C, 
It's an immune booster, and so that Activate study that I mentioned earlier, which is using a, an exposer, panabinostat, is also using interferon to try to do that expose and clear strategy. And then finally, therapeutic vaccines are boosting the body's own immune response against HIV, and we're starting several of those also um, within the next months. What is probably going to be the case, though, is you're probably going to need to combine an agent that exposes HIV, one of those HDAC inhibitors or something like that, with something that clears the virus, like a therapeutic vaccine or an antibody, because it's probably going to take both to, to get rid of the virus. And then the last, and I think I'm, I think I'm right on time with the questions, I hope, um, is um, uh, that, that protect idea. Can you protect the cells from HIV by modifying them? And so um, that first strategy, can, I think someone suggested this, infuse CD4 cells that have been engineered, basically, to lack the co-receptor, to lack the protein uh, that's needed for HIV to infect the cell. There was a, a trial of such a strategy, and that's a lot safer than doing a bone marrow transplant. Uh, the challenge is getting enough of those cells immune to, to really be able to safely stop antiretroviral therapy, and people are, are working on that. And then really high-tech things are taking gene therapy, something called CRISPR-Cas9, to, to really protect those cells or even pluck out the HIV from those latently infected cells. That's far off, I think, or further off, but some people are trying. So we need, to how to do, we need to know how to do this, but we also need to know how to do it safely, you know, more safely than a bone marrow transplant. So these are some examples of studies going, around, going on uh, around town. Um, there's some literature about some of these studies in the back, but there'll be uh, people here to talk about these. There's studies of starting antiretroviral therapy early, okay? That, it's not going to cure it, but maybe it'll preserve the immune response. There's that, a, a study of trying to combine an HDAC inhibitor with a, a hormonal therapy called tamoxifen. It's being done in women. It's the first uh, women-only uh, HIV cure trial. So that's another way to try to expose the virus. It's a combination of an exposure plus a, a, a hormonal therapy. And then activate is another example of that, that second strategy of, of uh, latency reversal. Immune therapies, a whole bunch of them. The, there's the activate study again, which is the interferon um, panabinostat study, but then the broadly neutralizing antibody studies and therapeutic vaccine studies. So this is my second to last slide. Can we cure HIV? Someone asked. So right now, um, HIV, thus far, HIV has only been cured under really extraordinary circumstances. The, the Berlin patient, there's a couple of examples of people who got treated very early who have kind of a remission, but it's really un uncommon. So it's an aspirational goal. Uh, there are studies underway to test new ways of exposing, clearing, and protecting, and I think combinations are going to be necessary. Uh, there's going to need to be an increased knowledge of how to measure the reservoir. Remember, I told you one of the challenges is how do you even find it, and then how do you reduce the reservoir. And then one of the things that Dr. Lee and everyone is going to talk about is the ethics of doing these cure trials. Antiretroviral therapy, despite some side effects, and especially the older drugs, generally is safer than it used to be. And there are some uncertainties about these new interventions, so we've got to pay close attention to people living with HIV, what their perspective is on these trials do these under the um, uh, highest kind of scientific and ethical standards. So I'd like to quote um, our uh, former President Obama, who said in 2013 uh, on World AIDS Day that the U.S. should be at the forefront of new discoveries into how to put HIV into long-term remission. What, this is what we're talking about, remission without requiring lifelong therapies, or better yet, he said, to eliminate it completely. Or as a patient of mine said, one day, I'd love to say I used to have uh, HIV. So with that, I'm going to stop, um, see if there's other questions. I, Basolo, you tell me where we are on time. Take a few more? Okay, good. So I hope there are a few more questions. I've really liked the questions so far. So any others? Yep. Yep. Yep, the gene therapy. Yeah. So that's this protect idea. So these, um, did I get that right? Yeah. Those, infuse, those cells that people are engineering, those are lacking CCR5. The trouble right now is they can't get 100% of the cells protected, so they're, tr they're trying to make it more efficient. But that's, that's, um, that's the strategy that some people are taking, is to try to take out CD4 cells from a person, change them so that they're immune to uh, HIV by changing CCR5, and then putting it back into the person. But right now, you can get 1 to 10 percent of the cells that are, that are immune, but you can't get 100 percent of the cells that are immune. So that's, that's what people are trying to figure out how to do. So does that answer your question? So. Sure. Other um, 
questions about this or anything else that I didn't talk about? I, it's a big field, so I couldn't cover everything. I tried to give you some examples, but if there's something you've heard about or you know, wondered about, um, and I'll be here so I can take questions later also, but if there's any questions you want to ask me now, I'm happy to take them. Uh, well, uh, since you're going in a building-based uh, field study. Say that again. The 30-day cure study, um, was it one of the slides that was up here that I showed, or was or something I said? One of the studies on a mass Yeah. Ah, okay. Thank you. Yes. So that activate study is being done by uh, Dr. Lichterfeld. That is about, you're right, that's about a, it's actually, the treatment itself is, is about a week, but people are followed for 30 days. That, that, um, you're absolutely right. You know, that's a stage study where they started with a very, very low dose. They went to a medium dose, and they're seeing if it's safe, and then they'll go to the, the, the final dose, the, the target dose. People have done well in terms of so, um, side effects, relatively few side effects. Interferon can cause people to feel a little flu-like. Um, again, some people uh, know about interferon here. Um, but since the interferon is only given as a single shot, it, it's only a couple of days of uh, that flu-like symptoms. Um, in terms of does it get rid of the HIV, we don't know. We don't know. What they do is they, they have to go through the, the first phase, take everyone's cells, and then check if they've had an effect. Then they go through the second phase. When everyone's done with the second phase, then, then they check those cells. And so I don't know if, I, I'm pretty sure they don't have results yet, um, but people are, have done well in terms of tolerating the therapy. I think maybe this time next year um, we will know the results of the first two phases, probably not the third phase, because the third phase of that hasn't st started yet. Yeah. 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 Take on that. Yeah. Yeah. So you're absolutely right. There is a new understanding that our gut, you know, most of our cells in our body are, are not um, human cells, they're bacterial cells in, in the microbiome, the, the bacteria living inside the gut. And it turns out that influences not only our health, but our vaccine responses, our immunity. Um, so there's a lot of um, hope that by modifying the microbiome, we might improve immune responses, we might improve um, other aspects of health. There's a person sitting right there uh, who's the world's expert in microbiome. His name is Doug Kwan. And so uh, I'm going to let him take that question <laughs> when he gets up here. I'm going to punt that to him. Uh, but I think it's something that's um, really, um, it, it's a good question. I don't think that, I don't know all the answers, and I don't think we as a group know all the answers, but people are trying to study it. Do you want to answer I'll, my question? I'll just say, actually, I'm going to be speaking during the panel discussion. I'll, I'll actually have a few slides on that, so I'll address that there. Okay, perfect. Any, uh, tell me, Basola, I could go on forever, so. <laughs> so. Okay, you have several minutes. Okay, four more minutes. Right four more minutes. Please. Yeah, yeah. Let me. Yeah, I'll repeat the question. So, um, so let me try to repeat your question, but may, let me make, then tell me if I got it. So one is the time frame of some of these studies, and then is there, as you complete one study, can you use the results of that to try to improve and inform other studies? Is that, that's the basic question? Okay, so the, um, the time frame of some of these studies. So here are a couple of examples of studies. This is not comprehensive because the field is big, but the first study, starting antiretroviral therapy soon after infection, a little over 100 people have been enrolled in that study around the country. And what I think is those people who take those very early therapies, they will be really good candidates for some of the other trials because they tend to have lower reservoirs. The sooner you get in, the smaller your reservoir. They tend to have less disrupted inflammation, um, and they have stronger immune responses. So the time frame of that study is they, that wants to enroll about 150 people, and then hopefully those people will take part in future studies. So I, I think by the end of this year, that first trial of early antiretroviral therapy will have 150 people in it. That was the target. Um, Latency reversal agents, um, there are many of these going on around the country. The one being done in Boston um, is trying to enroll 30 women around the country. 
As of uh, Monday, um, there had been um, 28 women screened within about three weeks. That, that, this is, um, I've been involved in a lot of trials. This is the first trial I've been involved with that, in, that exceeded expectations in terms of how quickly it enrolled. Um, it, many, many women r have been signing up for this study. So that study, I think, uh, will finish its enrollment this year, uh, for, for sure, uh, because we're at 28 out of 30. And in terms of results from that, that's about a 35-day treatment um, with the Varinostat, which is the exposer, the latency reversal agent, plus um, tamoxifen. Many of these studies, again, you have to get all the people through it, and then you have to do the testing. So I can't say that the results will be available this year. I'd, I'd be surprised, actually, if they'd be available this year, but hopefully next year. And then with those studies, we'll, t we'll, we'll be able to say, is this strategy something that can be tested in men? Is it a strategy that improves that exposed aspect, the latency reversal? If it does, then what you want to do is combine the exposed strategy the, the, um, you know, uh, with an immune strategy. So that would be, this would inform that next trial you know, that would start after that. Activate, I already said, has gone through the first phases. And so I bet we'll have results by next year for the first phases. And then again, if we see some promise, what we're looking for in some ways is a signal. Can we show that we're doing something that is getting rid of HIV, even if it doesn't get rid of it completely? Uh, if we get rid of part of it, kind of like you know, in the AZT era, AZT didn't, you know, wasn't effective enough, but it, it was a building stone, and then we added to it, and then we finally got better and better and better. So I view this as the same way. If we see a signal that we're, we're getting rid of HIV, it may not get rid of it all the way, but at least it tells us Let's go on to a second combination. These BNAP studies are, the broadly neutralizing antibody studies are, are moving quickly. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Yog and uh, Dr. Stevenson at the end are doing those studies. They'll tell you uh, where those are at, but they're, they're moving pretty quickly. And I think people will build on those. So for example, I was at a meeting uh, yesterday. That's why I actually was in San Francisco <laughs> yesterday, so I came back last night, um, or actually this morning, <laughs> to be more specific. <laughs> But they were talking about combining those broadly neutralizing antibodies with what's called the latency reversal agent, one of those exposers called TLR7. They're going to start a human study of that because in monkeys, it looks like um, it was able to at least control HIV in about half of the monkeys that got it. So uh, antibody plus a TLR7 agonist, um, the company that makes those is, is planning a trial, I think, for this year. So. So yeah, there's a lot of work in this area, a lot of overlapping trials, but the whole point is to iterate, you know, get a signal, then build on it, get a better trial, and, and get us to where we need to be. Maybe last question? Oh, yeah. last question? Yeah. I'll make it quick. <laughs> <laughs> um, forgive me, I'm a layman here, yeah. and I don't know, because today is the first time I have a student in Fairfield Hospital. Yep. So tell me, what is a uh, high or low difference, is good or bad, what is a reservoir? Okay. So reservoir, the what? Say it again. <laughs> that, that sounds like the. Um, yeah. How can you go? <laughs> um, so the reservoir means uh, basically the reservoir when the viral load gets down but undetectable, the reservoir means the HIV that's left. Okay. And you can't, you can't go to your doctor and get a measurement. It's not like I can go, you know, I can't have you come into my clinic and, and send off a blood test to, you know, Mayo or wherever to get a reservoir test. I've got to send it to one of these special labs that do these reservoir assays. The lower the reservoir, the better. Kind of like the lower the viral load, the better. Um, our hope is to eventually get the reservoir to undetectable. But the reservoir um, is what, if you stop antiretroviral therapy, that's that HIV that's still there. It's, uh, sleeping HIV is another way to call it, you know, um, invisible HIV. I mean, it's the HIV that's in your body that's hard to find with a viral load. You can't find it with a viral load. But if you stop antiretroviral therapy, that reservoir is just kind of there, and it spits out HIV, and it starts it all over again. So, so it's, you want a low reservoir. Everyone wants a low reservoir. Um, yeah. Um, and uh, lower the better. Um, the younger the better. You know, the, the, you can't be too young. You can't be, so you can't have too low of a reservoir. So you want to have a low reservoir, but I can't t you can't measure it just. In fact, one of the challenges is it's even hard to measure in the research setting. So, but the reason why we keep talking about it, we keep talking about it, is we think that unless you get rid of the reservoir, if you stop antiretroviral therapy, um, this, this will come back. So, okay.